Hi people, uh, my name is Aurelian and I started this business 14 years ago. Uh, the name of the business is Adaptive Design Limited. Uh, we are in the business of designing uh, electronic boards and manufacturing electronic boards. Initially we had no idea that we are going to manufacture things. Uh, we started to build prototypes and we got better and we just raised the bar until we got to a point where we were make, making manufacturing for others. We become like a service provider in the industry. Uh, this video is not about us. Um, it's about the challenges for setting up such a business and uh, all the difficulties that you might face uh, if you are going to start such a business. We don't want to put you off. We actually encourage young people to watch careful and take decisions based on this information. And we hope that this industry stays alive after we fade away. So um, that was what this video is intended. Uh, now what this video is not, it's not a self-promoting video. It's not a uh, personal promoting video. Uh, I will try to stay to the, to the point of uh, running the business. Uh, a little bit of background, I'm an engineer, I'm uh, 52 years old and uh, the business is based in Ireland. Uh, those are some important facts because you will see when we drill down into the, into the bullet points um, there are a few important things that you need to be aware when you run a business like this. So first, uh, I'll cover a few bullet points that I think they are important if you want to run such a business and then I'll go again to the same points in the, from the perspective of running the business with competition from Asia, which might be something worth to be mentioned. So first, the, probably the most important thing on my list is skills. So you need to have the proper skills if you want to make something like this. Usually people which they start a business, like you see behind me, they are people which they've been working in the industry for a few years as employees, or uh, hobbyists which they just push the envelope to the next level, next level, and so on. But um, it, I recommend if you want to start something like this, make sure you have the skills because this is not something that you will learn very quick by looking over someone's shoulder. You need a little bit of background and I mean that kind of background that you get into a school and in the library, not watching YouTube videos. Good, so what kind of skills or what kind of mix, what mix of skills you need? So first of all, you need an engineer, at least an engineer. Because all the machines that you see behind me, they need to be programmed. And the programming of those machines originates from the design files. So usually how it works, uh, a company comes or an individual comes to your business with a bunch of files and uh, they give you those files. And you need to be able to extract the relevant information from those files in order to assemble the boards. So what is the relevant information? Let's PCB data, uh, bill of materials, uh, whatever, everything which it's deemed important for the, for the production. Uh, I'll speak just a little bit about the, the, the production, what, what, what I'm talking about production. So you need to be able to order somewhere the bare PCBs, right? So usually you order in, in China because the way it is, they're much cheaper and they get them faster and quality is very good. Uh, you can try from patriotism to make them somewhere in closer in Europe or somewhere else, but you will pay, I don't know, five times the price or three times the price. So the moment you get the bare PCBs, right, you need to order the parts, the parts which are going to be placed on those PCBs so, and soldered obviously on those PCBs. Uh, you get the parts in-house, uh, you put them on those machines and you start building boards, right? And you run through this, 
process of making board. At the end, you might need to test the boards um, and you know, label them and ship them. That's in a nutshell. Right? Now, this is a little bit more complicated than you will see when we go down in, into the details. So, coming back to skills. I said that you need an engineer. Why? You need to be able to understand the engineering data or the CAD files that you are going to get. Now, some good technicians, they have enough level of understanding of those files. So you might get away if you are a technician. But this is not something easy to understand for, for an operator, let's say. So, I would say the kind of skills you need, it's medium to advanced. Then you need to program those machines. So uh, all those coordinates where the, the parts are going to land, they need to be somehow, they need to end up on those machines. Most of the time when you get those files with the coordinates, they're just simple text files or Excel spreadsheets and you need to convert them into the machine formats. So there are tools to do this. So this is something that you do offline. So you're some, somewhere in front of a PC in an office and you do that and you prepare the, those files that you are loading on the machine, right? So this is the first step you have to do. Now, for this, you need skills. It's, just, it's, you, it's something that, it's not that difficult to learn, but you need, one, you need to know what you're doing. Now, coming down to skills, it's not just engineers and technicians. So when you run such a line, there are a lot of operations where you don't need to have loads of skills. One good example is you need to take the board. People, they think that this is fully automated. Yes, it is automated up to a point. And when I say up to a point, it's you will end up with a part that the machine, they cannot fit. Or you can fit that part with the machine, but you need to spend loads of money to buy some extra extras for the machine just for one part. And maybe you have to run only, I don't know, a thousand boards. And it's not a good business decision. So what you do, you just place that part by hand. And so you need uh, somebody with a steady hand or somebody who has good eyes and uh, they can do that. So, but you don't need loads of skills. This is something that can be learned. So it's, it's basically, I would say, operator level job, right? So you need operators. You can't get away without operators. That's, that's set. It's a fact. Now, how many operators? This is an interesting question. Now, if you're a small shop, uh, most of the time you don't auto, you don't want to automate everything because you can't afford. I mean, probably you want, but you can't afford. So somebody needs to uh, put labels. Somebody needs to put the board in uh, on the tester. Somebody needs to take the boards from the tester. Sometimes you have machines which are not in line, so they are not connected with conveyors. So you need to handle them, or you need to just put them in bags and boxes and ship them. So it's a lot of labor that uh, nobody actually shows. Every time when they show a factory, they show those fancy machines which they move very fast and they look very, very interesting. No, it's a lot of labor behind. So you need to have a good mix between qualified people and not so qualified, but good operators. Okay, so we're pushing now to the next step, machines, right? So you need to have machines. So everything that you can automate, you should automate if you can afford. Uh, that's the way you make money. You're not making money by hiring a hundred more laborers. You're making money by automating things. As, as much as you can automate, you have to automate. Now, when you buy those machines, as a small shop, you can't afford to buy brand new, latest and the greatest, because they're expensive. I mean, a machine like this, as new, is probably 150 grand uh, euros. Uh, uh, plus feeders, the feeders are those parts. I have one here to show you. So those are some the feeders what they do they just take the part which is presented on on tape and it's presenting the part on the in the machine to the head which is picking and is placing the part. Very very simple. So those are another part of the machine. And of course they they need to match the size of your parts. Larger parts, larger feeders so you can see those feeders are larger, those are smaller. So 
in the cost of the machine is actually the cost of the feeders. The cost of the feeder is somehow variable because you need to have the right mix for the right uh, products, but that's a, that's a different story. So, machines. You need to buy machines. Now, when it comes down to buying a machine, probably you, as a small shop, you can't afford to buy new because you don't have a million. Unless, I don't know, you are very, very rich, but probably if you are very rich, you're not going to set up a shop like this. So, if you are not very rich, uh, you're going to buy machines which are second hand, in good shape, and uh, they're good enough for what you want, right? You don't need the latest and the greatest. If you ask most of the people which they start a production uh, shop, uh, they will tell you that they started uh, with, with some old machines and then they, they progressed from there. So, most of the people, they need to finance the purchase of this machine, right? So, you, unless you are sitting on a pile of cash. So there is a cost in buying or leasing the machine, whichever way you want to go. Now there is another. There are other costs when it comes to machines. The machines are not something that you buy. You put them there. You plug them. Off we go. No, they need to be maintained. Uh, what maintenance mean? Uh, there are many things which they need to be oiled. They need to be checked. They need to be calibrated. And uh, you have to do this every six months or every one year, depends. Now, on old machines, you will have breakdowns. Even on new machines, you have breakdowns. On old machines, you have probably more. Uh, all those breakdowns, they are going to cost you. They are going to cost you time because you might have the machine loaded with the project and the customer is waiting for you to make board and the machine is down. And uh, you have to pay serious money to get things up and going. Uh, second, you need to spend money on a technician which comes from the company which manufactured the machine. Unless you are an expert in those machines, which there are people which they, 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 they are experts in those machines. Um, usually they don't work in a shop like this, but I don't know. It might be, I mean, there are people which they know how to fix them. Uh, then spare parts, right? So when you need to change a part, uh, there is not much choice in buying generic parts, so you need to go to the uh, representative of the manufacturer of the machine and buy those parts. They are not cheap, because they don't sell many of them, so they are going to cost you serious money. So that's another expense, right? Then, another expense when it comes to machine, feeders. Yeah, those feeders, right? They get worn. Uh, you need to replace them, you need to fix them, you need to calibrate them. There is actually a market when it comes to feeders. Now, they, those feeders, they can originate from the manufacturer or you can buy generic um, feeders, um, of course from China. And I love this term in China, original copies. You can buy original copies. Those are two words, they shouldn't be used uh, side by side. But anyway, um, so you can buy pretty good feeders from some sources which are cheaper than the normal, let's you know, say, the manufacturer of the machines, which they're okay. I mean, they're not great, but they're not bad either. We can save a few bobs, but you need to spend money. This is what I'm saying. Because you want to have a large combination of feeders, especially to cover a large amount of, uh, of the types of parts. You can't afford to not to have a feeder for a part where you have a board which has 300 parts on it. Like, look, for example, this, this is a board which has 400 parts, right? So if you don't have a feeder for a part, what you're going to do, just place it by hand? This is going to destroy your, your, your um, efficiency. So you need to have feeders. And uh, you can't afford to have all the feeders on the planet in, the, in the, your first day when you open the shop. So you, it's, it's a thing that you're going to accumulate more feeders and more feeders and you're going to replace them because they break after a while. And, but it's coming down to the cost. It, it, this is a cost. You need to be aware of this cost. Feeders, they are going to cost. And it's a constant expense that you need to be aware of. So when it comes to machine, I said it's an initial cost, like a capital cost when you buy those machines, maintenance cost, spare parts, feeders. Those are the probably all of them when it comes to machine. Okay, now materials. When I say materials, I refer to parts. 
So you get a bill of material from the from your customer. So you need to source those parts. Now there are two models here. Some on some projects, the customer is actually creating a kit with all the parts. So you get a box with all the parts. Uh, it happens for us probably once in a blue moon, uh, not many times. So you need to source those parts. This is very very big effort to source those parts. It's not it's not something that should be taken lightly. So you need to talk to suppliers. You need to uh, make sure you buy them uh, at the right price. Uh, I'm not saying now that there is a big you know, there's a big crisis of uh, silicon and uh, you can't buy microcontrollers, you can't buy MOSFETs and you can't find diodes and you can't find many, many other things. And you end up buying them at, a, at a ridiculous prices just to get things going. So sourcing parts, it's a very, very important part of the process. And it's an expensive part of the process. Why it's expensive? It cannot be done by people which they don't know what they do. Because it's risky. It doesn't matter if you buy all the parts and you, if one of them is not the right part, your board is not going to work and everything goes down. So it's a very big responsibility when you buy parts. Uh, it's a lot of money involved and you have to be very careful. So moving on a little bit, projects. Now when I say projects, I mean the board that you need to build, right? Those projects, they will be very, very different. And probably that's the, most, the interesting part of the job, that uh, one project doesn't look like the other project. Uh, when it comes to projects, you will see many, many, many types of projects. Like, you will see long runs where it's a very simple board which we have very large quantity. This, this is happy days, you know, it's easy, just, you know, you tag along and you make money, right? You will not have many of these. The worst ones are when you get very, very complicated boards in low quantities. Why I'm saying this? You can't automate everything. I said this from, from the beginning. And what do I mean by that? There will be steps when you build a board that you need to spend on labor. I'll give an example with the same board I have here. This board has many, many parts. As you can see, most of them are surface mount, but there are parts which are two hold, which means you need to insert them. They have pins and they need to go to the board. So this particular board actually has two faces. So you build one face with surface mount, you build the other face with surface mount, and then you put the two holes and you go another, another run into a, wave soldering um, oven, which is going to solder only the two holes. Of course, you need uh, you need a pallet where you put the board and it's exposing only the, what it needs to be soldered, or if you have a s selective soldering machine, it will solder those pins one by one. But there are manual steps here. What is the first manual step? You need to insert those components. Yeah, people, they say, yeah, but they're insertion machine. Yes, but an insertion machine, it doesn't make sense when you make 500 boards. So you will do it manually. You need a person to do this. You need a person which knows what he's doing. He's not putting parts the wrong way around and then generate a lot of work for reworking those boards. Then, this board is a good example. There is a big inductor here on this board. You need to solder this manually. This is not going to solder because this part is oversized. So this is a manual job. So there will be steps which they will have a lot of labor. Another good example is someone needs to take this board after the parts are inserted and put it on a pallet and put it to the wave solder oven. That's manual. It's not, we don't have robots here to do this. And then someone needs to take those pallets, take the boards from the pallet and populate more boards on those pallets and run them again to the oven. So there is a lot of work. People, they don't realize. Uh, every time when they show uh, how boards are made, they show pick and place machine which they place parts very, very quick. Yes, that is part of the process. But that's the easy part, I would say. Okay, so every single design or every single product has a different balance between automation 
and non-automation. When I say non-automation, that's a lot of labor cost. So you can't be very picky because you can't just say, oh yeah, you know, that's too hard for us, just give it to someone else. Because you're a small shop, you want to get, you want to get jobs in. So you're going to accept even projects which are not that labor intensive, I would say. So another, another dimension of this is, or another part where labor is important. The parts, they don't jump from the box to the machine. I wish they could. The parts, they get delivered like this, right? In a box, in a bag. And they need to end up here. And this needs to end up there. So that is labor. That is a lot of labor. And you need to know what you're doing. Because if you put the wrong part in the wrong place, you end up with the wrong board. So this is a cost. And you want to be very, very careful with this. Why? Because when you price a job, you need to, you need to understand there is a cost of, to set up the line or to set up the product. And that cost, it's something which is, it doesn't matter if you're making one board, they're making a thousand board. So for small runs, the cost, the setup cost is significant. And some of your customers, they will not understand that. They are thinking, you're putting 10 parts on, on my board. How come it's so expensive? It's expensive because those 10 parts, they need to end up on the machine, right? So, careful when you choose jobs, uh, make sure you understand. Um, but you will learn. I mean, you will make a few mistakes, you will get burned, and then you will learn. But I want to make you aware of this. Okay, so we talked about those costs, right? Now, I'm going to run to the same points, but now, facing a competitive landscape, especially from Asia, right? I'm talking China mainly here. But it's not only China. China, India, Vietnam, whatever. So, first of all, the first, the first thing which is a big difference is cost of labor. As I said before, there is a lot of labor here, which it's kind of happening behind the cameras, but there is a lot of labor. So as a small shop, you need to make sure that your labor costs are in check. Now, labor costs in Western Europe against Asia, it's a very, very big difference. Very, very big difference. The USA is probably the same, the same thing. So you can't afford too many operators, which means you need to multiplex different positions in a, in a small, in a small um, operation. So you need to have people which they are okay to work on the pick and place machine, okay to insert uh, parts by hand, okay to run them to a, a wave solding oven. So you need to make sure, and which comes down to skills. But in the same time, you can't ask an employee to be all those positions and work on the minimum wage. So this is a major problem, right? You need to have good technicians, which they can multiplex those positions. But in the same time, you need to pay them a technician salary. And this is where it's very hard to compete with China. So look, I'm not going to rant here about oh, what we are doing. No, those are the realities. and. Some people, they, they work around them, some people, they, it's, but those are the facts. Now, machines, this is a very interesting one, and people, they don't talk much about this. Cost of the machine, right? So, you're a small guy, you want to set up a shop, so you buy some machines, like we did, and we kept changing them as we evolved. So, you finance this buy, because unless you are, you are sitting on a pile of cash, and like I said, you need to finance them. So you take a loan, right? Or you go leasing or whatever. So there is a cost associated with this. Now, some of the companies in China, they don't have this cost because those machines they have, they're actually financed by the state. So they don't have a finance cost built in into their business. It's, you know, the Communist Party gives you a nice check to buy a new line, fantastic. I'm not saying that uh, we should have a communist party, I'm saying those are the facts. Right, so this is a, an expense that we have and we don't have. Okay, 
still on the machine. Cost of the machine, the price, the actual price. It's interesting. Major machine manufacturers for the same model of the machine, they charge less when they sell them in China. I have no idea why. Uh, so if I want to buy this particular machine in Shenzhen, it's about 30% cheaper than buying it in Western Europe. Now, why they do this? I have no idea. Probably because it's a bigger market, they sell many of them, I don't know. But this is creating a disadvantage for us. Uh, even on the, on the second-hand market, there is still this imbalance. So, I don't know, machine manufacturers out there, what are you trying to do? Move everything in China? I think you're halfway doing that. Now, spare parts. Right, the way to buy spare parts for those machines, you go to the representative, uh, the close, we are using Juki. And we love this uh, Juki. So, we are buying parts from Germany or from, in Scotland I think is the closest um, representative from. Uh, the prices that we are getting quoted, we, we actually, in so many years, we never bought anything from those guys, from Germany or from Scotland. Why? Because we buy spare parts from the Chinese representative of Juki for a fraction of the cost. So exactly the same part. So again, part manufacturer and machine manufacturer, they sell parts, spare parts in China, much, much cheaper than they sell on the uh, Western market. So again, in balance. Now, feeders. This is an interesting one, right? Feeders. If I buy this feeder in China, it's about a quarter of the price. Right? Why? Because it's made in China. I understand. But a quarter of the price? Now, it's a Juki feeder. It's not some, you know, cuckoo land sweatshops. So, they can afford to sell me this on a quarter, quarter of a price. Again, how do I compete with, with this? Now, I know how to compete with China with this. I'm buying it from China. But that's, again, oh, oh, what are those companies, what the machine manufacturers trying to do? Push everything in China? As I said, they're halfway there, if not more. Okay, so there is an imbalance here. If you're running this shop in China, maintenance cost, parts cost, feeders, and actual machine, you buy them cheaper. We need to compete with that. Okay, I guess we have deeper pockets. I think that's, that's their, their argument, the machine manufacturer argument. But in the end, we are trying to run a business here. Okay, now, electronic parts. That's another interesting one. When it comes to parts, uh, there is always a, a difference in price for the same part when you buy it in China. Now, not so much on the sem semiconductor. I mean, if you buy a microcontroller, let's say, made by NXP or by ST or by I don't know, some other manuf major manufacturer, the price is kind of the same. Uh, maybe they, they have a little bit better pricing because of their volume. They buy in larger volumes and they probably they have uh, slightly lower margins. But I'm not sure why, but the big difference is when it comes to passive, to capacitors and resistors. So prices for the parts in China for passive sometimes is 50% less. So there is a very big imbalance there. And I'm not talking about generic parts, because generic parts, that's a different story, generic parts are way cheaper. No, I'm talking the same part. So you buy a capacitor from, I don't know, TDK or, I don't know, some inductor from Coilcraft or, I don't know, I'm just, they're just examples, right? So there is a cost saving when it comes to the cost of the bill of material, the bond cost, right? So how do we compete with that? Now, yeah, uh, we are we're going to end up buying, uh, you know, resistors and capacitors from China, I guess. I mean, uh, let's burn fuel and uh, bring one reel at a time uh, by plane with DHL. I mean, if that's, that's the way to go, but I don't think that's the way to go. I think the parts distributors, they need to Make sure they charge the same thing. I uh, probably don't want to. But anyway. 
Okay, and the last one, labor. When it comes to labor, right? Uh, I'm not going to say, oh yeah, in China they have uh, uh, lower labor cost. And no, when I, what I'm trying to say here when it comes to labor, in China and Asia, because of the labor cost is so low, they can afford to buy more labor for the same money. So to run a line like this, you will need operators. There is no way you're going to do it with one person or two person. Uh, only in the presentation videos you see one guy here pressing some, you know, touching the, the, the screen there and the, the whole line runs under his, uh, you know, finger. No, there's no such thing. You run out of a part. You need uh, somebody to bring a wheel, put the wheel. There is a guy which is taking boards out of the oven. There is another lady which is uh, checking some, uh, you know, if a part is uh, uh, upside down or, you know, not placed correctly and is giving it uh, a nudge and then it goes in the oven. There is always something like this. Or there is a part which is not fitted by the machine and there is a conveyor here with the station when somebody is actually placing that part with the, with the set of tweezers. So there is always need for labor, regardless how automated you are. So if you look to a line in China, same size, I'm not talking about the big multinationals, you know, making smartphones. No, I'm talking small shops. They have many, many people, they're running the show. Sometimes you see ladies which they have chairs side by side, they can touch their elbows. So we can't afford that. There is no way in Western Europe you can afford that. So we need to be clever. We need to work with less people. That's the way it is. I'm not complaining, right? So that's pretty much in a nutshell what you are facing to compete against uh, against a Chinese shop, right? A Chinese SMT shop or electronic manufacturing shop. Um, I hope this is actually useful. I hope the video is not putting off people which they want to start a business like this. Um, but in the same time, I hope they see those problems and they just, you know, they are aware of those problems and they put a plan in place to work around those problems or to fix those problems if they can. And uh, that concludes my video. I'll try to make another video about the whole process, how the boards are made. Uh, with every single step and what is involved in every single step, if I can. Uh, as I said, this is not to promote uh, the business, not to promote myself, I don't care about this. Uh, I don't have a Facebook account. Uh, the, probably the only account I have is LinkedIn. Uh, please don't subscribe, don't hit the bell. Uh, this is not the kind of video, uh, like you see, the typical video on YouTube with uh, the truth about or demystifying, no, I'm not demystifying anything here, which is, those are just facts. So, just take them as facts. Now, those are my personal opinions, they might be totally different from your opinions, but um, maybe someone finds this information useful. Take care and stay healthy.